Chapter 356 We went around the corner, simultaneously applying muggle repellent charms, without which we had been walking all this time. Delphine took my hand and told me to get ready. The apparition was strange there were foreign elements in it. We found ourselves in a small circular room, and Delphine clearly noticed the question in my gaze. Special algorithms for activating apparition. You can't get in here without their knowledge. Let's go. We had to go through only one corridor in the guild dungeons to get back to the certification hall. Like last time, I stood in the middle of a large circle, and the wizards, joined by Lady Greengrass, sat at tables going up and away like an amphitheater. When everyone took their seats, Grandmaster Hart, still in the same white clothes, took the floor. As the chairperson of the 21st Attestation Commission for the title of Master in the Field of Transfiguration, I have the honor to announce the results of the seventh meeting in order to confirm the qualifications of the applicant. The commission unanimously decided that the applicant Maximilian Knight from the Black family fully confirmed his qualification for the title of Master in the Field of Transfiguration. The official confirmation comes into force on this day of this month, 1995th year according to the generally accepted calendar. Despite my barely contained joy, I noticed Delphine's look of sudden concern. Maximilian Knight Please come forward, with these words, the table in front of the Grand Master transformed, forming a ladder from her to the circle I was standing on. I headed toward this staircase, and the Grand Master began to descend, holding a small box in her hand. We met at the beginning of the stairs, where the first step touched the hall floor. Grand Master Hart opened the box, inside which a simple gold ring lay on red velvet, and only where you usually expect to see some jewelry, a snake was engraved in the form of a semicircle. Put your hand on the ruby on the lid of the box, the Grand Master said. Everything is as it should be according to the protocol. I put my hand to the tiny ruby, immediately feeling the activation of complex magical circuits throughout the box and inside the ring. I had to wait a few seconds for the activation to finish. Accept this ring as a sign confirming your qualifications. Accepting the ring, I placed it on the middle finger of my left hand. Of course. There was one question in my head why is the Ouroboros not complete it seemed to be reflected in my gaze, and Grandmaster Hart allowed herself a slight stern smile, somewhat reminding McGonagall. Congratulations, Master Knight. The box remains here as a testament to your skill. I hereby declare the seventh meeting of the 21st Attestation Commission over. The wizards got up from their seats, and after applauding for a dozen seconds, they began to go about their business, disappearing into the darkness and Delphine walked swiftly down to us. As for Ouroboros, the Grand Master spoke as she closed the box, it will close when you receive the rank of Master in Alchemy. Lady Greengrass approached us, looking apologetically at the Grand Master. I beg your pardon, Grand Master Hart, but we must hurry back. Has something happened this middle-aged lady's face showed concern. I was hoping to sit down for a cup of tea because we haven't seen each other for so long. Unfortunately, Sudden and urgent matters cannot wait. I will definitely visit you soon. Well, since it is so necessary, I do not dare to detain you. The Grand Master moved her hand through the air, and something subtly changed in the magic around her. You can leave with the port K A right here. I'll wait for the letter, my girl, the Grand Master smiled, and Delphine literally shoved the chain into my hands, immediately pronouncing. Porches. A whirlwind of spatial distortion swirled us in its frantic dance, throwing us out a few seconds later in the same place in Hogsmeade that we had moved from. It was late evening here, as it had been in Prague, and the lights were on in the houses. I need to go to Hogwarts, Delphine said shortly, immediately disappearing into the black smoke of apparition. I followed her. Very quickly, we covered the distance to the open gates. Before each door, I had to get out of the apparition for although you can move this way in the castle, but not through walls, doors and other material obstacles without destroying them. Once inside the castle, Delphine listened to something and went back into apparition, moving toward the main tower. Suddenly, a fire broke out in front of us, from which Fox and Dumbledore immediately appeared, with a wand at the ready. Ah, it's you, the headmaster put his wand away, gesturing for Fox to fly. You're just in time, Mrs. Greengrass. Mr. Knight. The headmaster looked a little worried, no, annoyed and angry, but not worried. 
What's with my kids? Delphine immediately appeared across from the headmaster and looked extremely serious. No harm, except for a couple of minor abrasions and bruises. The problem is in the situation itself. I suppose you would like to see for yourself by proceeding to the hospital wing. Mr. Knight, you should come with us as well. Chapter 357 Without asking too many questions, we followed the headmaster. Lady Greengrass looked at the headmaster's right hand a couple of times, but it was clearly an illusion, the hand looked healthy. It only took us a couple of minutes to get to the hospital wing. As soon as we opened the doors, we were literally bombarded by the noise of painful moans and groans muffled by the spell. Twelve beds were occupied by students with injuries of varying severity, and from the looks of it, they were in a lot of pain. When I looked closely, I was surprised to recognize them as Slytherin students, including Malfoy, Knott, Crab, Goyle, and others from the sixth, seventh, and fourth years. The headmaster, however, led us further, to yet another door. I'll tell you right away, Mr. Knight, the headmaster spoke. Miss Granger is just as okay as Mrs. Greengrass's girls, but she only agrees to talk to you. We went through the next door, behind which there were more bunks, and around a small patch against the wall next to the window there was a large white screen, covering this place with itself. We came to it exactly. Poppy, may we come in the headmaster asked, and our healer's head immediately popped out from behind the screen. Madame Pomfret took a quick look at us, acknowledged us, and nodded, letting us in. There were two beds and bedside tables with jars of potions and ointments. Astoria was sitting on one of the beds, with a marble pail calm face and stroking the head of sobbing and shuddering Daphne, who was hugging her. Hermione was rushing around with a disheveled mop of hair, and for a brief moment, I even thought that it wasn't her at all there was so much undisguised anger in her eyes. As soon as she saw me, she was right next to me and hugged me, quickly pulling away. Her eyes softened a little. You said, she spoke, to show you this and tell you, not before Cruciatus. Control yourself. I have no idea what that means. Hermione pulled a parchment out of her robe pocket and handed it to me. Accepting it, I unfolded it and began to read. I don't understand anything. It's for protection against Umbridge, Hermione explained. I don't know the whole point, but she threatened that for the harm caused to a lot of pure blood wizards, the Muggleborn would be given hell. May I ask the headmaster turned to me. It was at that moment that Astoria and Daphne saw their mother and Delphine sat down on the bed beside them, and now Daphne was sobbing, burying her face in her shoulder. The apprentice master contract, I answered the headmaster. Between Hermione and me. But I only just... Be quiet, Mr. Knight, the headmaster interrupted me. I think I'm beginning to understand. Miss Granger, can you tell me exactly what happened? Only that, Hermione's face became calm, but anger splashed in her gaze now and then, that you know who decided to send greetings to us all, and these idiots were too confident in their exclusivity and impunity. You mean you put all those guys down? Not just me, but I can't say more. Not now. I waved my hand around, creating a spell to test the protection against taboos. The headmaster clearly understood the meaning and looked at me condescendingly. Just in case, I replied to that look, and the headmaster nodded. But I'm sorry, he said. What does it have to do with you, and young Miss and Miss Greengrass? Through me to teach Max a lesson. And through us, Astoria spoke quietly. To show Mother the error of her unwillingness to cooperate with the Dark Lord. So. The headmaster thought for a moment. Mr. Knight, please follow me. If I understand this correctly, we don't have much time. Mrs. Greengrass. I assume you wish to stay with the girls. Certainly. Headmaster. The headmaster nodded, muttering, it's amazing how history can repeat itself. He went out behind the screen, and I followed him, and my head was spinning with thoughts one worse than another, but the words, only bruises and scratches calmed, even if a little. We left the hospital wing at a brisk pace, and in a couple of minutes, we reached the headmaster's office, where it was twilight, and only a few soft yellow lights illuminated the space. It took a few more minutes for the headmaster to find a box somewhere in his stash, which he approached me with, opening it as he went. Here you go, Mr. Knight. I always knew it would come in handy sooner or later, but I didn't think it was for something like this. 
In the open box lay a locket in the shape of several thin rings, one within the other. In the middle of these rings was a circle with an hourglass. This is the time turner, Dumbledore explained, taking the artifact from the box and setting it aside on the table. A powerful artifact. Powerful and dangerous. I would like to tell you a lot about it, but I'm afraid that time is an unacceptable luxury at the moment. The headmaster gleamed his half-frame glasses in the semi-darkness of the office, handing me this artifact. We will have to limit ourselves to a quick briefing. Do not get caught in the eyes of yourself, and ideally no one at all. Be extremely careful. Put on the chain. As I put the chain around my neck, I looked at the headmaster. He was clearly calculating something, but it didn't take him more than a couple of seconds. I think two turns will be enough. Now, I'll head back to the hospital wing. I hope you know, Mr. Knight, that the gargoyle likes pistachio cream these days. She has specific tastes. I nodded as a sign that I understood. As soon as the headmaster disappeared behind the office door, I rotated the time-turner mechanism twice. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Chapter 358 From the action of the time-turner, the space around was amusingly distorted, and in the blurred outlines of the world, you could see traces of someone's presence. When the work of the time-turner was over, the horizon was red outside the window of the headmaster's office hinting at a very recent sunset. Without wasting a second, I immediately put a complex of concealing charms on myself and headed out of the office. Oddly enough, I had to tell the gargoyle the password to let me out. So the pistachio cream came in handy. It's an interesting feeling from this time turner, Rowena suddenly spoke up. Did you notice something interesting it so cunningly twisted the space and moved you in it in the manner of a port kea that I am amazed. A lot of things remain unclear but you will need to ask the headmaster for a device for research. Do you plan to constantly travel through time it's not about time? Someone obviously accidentally stumbled, as befits wizards of ancient times, on a working algorithm for moving in space, only with a fixed relative coordinate, but along a time dimension. At least that's how I see it. I see. By the way, I used to wonder why they don't use such a cool thing. While I was mentally communicating with Rowena, I calmed down, although I could still control myself. But what if I snap moreover, even though the headmaster said that there are no consequences as such, but still. And how do we know if they are using it or not most of the time turners are under the supervision of the Department of Mysteries, according to the books. Of course, if Dumbledore has it there will be others, but again how can we know if anyone has used it the influence of the time turner could not be calculated by an outside observer unless the user revealed himself. For an outsider, Everything is going as it should. For everyone, time goes linearly. And for the user too. In general, if you are interested, I believe that everything in this world is predetermined, and no matter how you flutter, you will do exactly what you should, and the choice is an illusion. After all, knowing absolutely all the properties and laws of the universe, you can calculate absolutely any event at any time interval. Unless, of course, there is a variable that did not originate here. If we start to philosophize on this topic, then such a conversation is unlikely to ever end. Let's leave metaphysics for later and talk about something more. Faster, or what by the way, can you go into the shadows and find all the participants of the upcoming events clearly feeling the slight outflow of magic, I noticed the shadows slipping under my feet, disappearing into the walls. Good, but we can still talk. I've been thinking about the possibilities of port keys not so long ago comparing their mechanism with your knowledge about the Alcubier drive. Well, as far as you remember it at all. By the way, you will definitely need to remember and process various theories about the world order. Get to the point. Unnoticed by any of the students I met, I made my way to the main tower and stood on one of the flights of stairs so that I was in the center of the circle and Rowena could have an equally good connection with me from anywhere in Hogwarts. I'm just drawing various parallels. The Port Kea also creates a bubble of space moving it to another place. The apparition deforms the space, bringing the two points as close as possible through an extremely thin puncture. Technically, this, of course, is not a puncture, but it's easier to imagine this way. Now, here is a time-turner that creates a region of space around the user but moves this bubble not in space, remaining stationary relative to the reference system Earth, but shifting it relative to time. But I couldn't understand the configuration of the spatial distortion. But even here, 
there is nothing surprising we, in fact, do not know anything at all about the structure of the world. How many dimensions are there changes in which of them and to what extent can cause certain changes already in the world and the properties of everything around to make the same string theory friends with the theory of relativity, you need to consider 26 dimensions. Very exciting, but what are you getting at even if we assume that absolutely everything can be calculated, and any event can be considered as having already happened, then why will the prophecy witnessed by the wizard necessarily come true? and the one that is not witnessed can be changed what is magic what is this wonderful energy that brings either stability or chaos to the universe. Decided to think about the universe in a way. I found the right Slytherins and Hermione. What's the plan? Chapter 359 After thinking about everything properly, I took off my bag and reproduced the contract right on the go, the already signed version of which is in my inner pocket. A funny nuance of the contract is the responsibility of the master mentor. In general, by the way, I overreacted, calling it a master-student contract. This version is exactly the mentor-student. Mentoring can be done by a wizard from the rank of an apprentice. Why did I make this one perhaps I didn't want to reveal my skills and there is no doubt that I have the rank of apprentice, for my master, Lady Greengrass, when I reach the rank of apprentice, should draw up a kind of act, certify, and if desired, send to the guild or just put it on a shelf in a far corner because to confirm this rank, a commission is not needed at all, and the master himself decides whether his student is worthy of such a privilege, which is not a privilege at all. However, the mentor-student contract already allows the mentor to take responsibility for the student's activities on himself, but at the same time, he has the right to refuse this responsibility. But the master's contract does not allow you to refuse if the student is not able to answer for his own actions and decisions. Another difference of the mentor's contract with the student is the opportunity of the latter to conclude other training contracts. In contrast, the master's contract allows you to have only one master, and the disciplines are formalized in the contract at once. It seems to me that such a restriction was introduced by the guilds, so that the masters would each look for their own student, eventually replenishing the ranks of the guilds, and not all pounce on one. Well, or maybe there is another reason. Anyway. I quickly wrote a contract on parchment, and here's a fun fact no matter how you look at these parchments, they are the same. No, it is clear that this is exactly what they should be, but it is one thing to understand and quite another to see with your own eyes. Rowena, a friend of my severe days, can you hang marks on them through the shadow let me try. Which ones do you want? Like in a grimoire, you know. Hmm. I felt a slight movement of magic in my body. Done. I really felt 15 targets located so far in different corners of the castle. Now I can write a note to Hermione, sign it, certify it with a spell, quickly make an envelope, put both the contract and the letter there, seal it and certify it again with a spell. Technically, such things can be faked, so I always check the magic as well. I think Hermione can do this too, even if her sensitivity is somewhat lower, but she is more than familiar with my magic. Oh, I got it. Timmy. I called to the house elf we both knew, and she appeared immediately, shaking her head from side to side in amazement. Then it was as if she sniffed and looked closely, sensing my magic, and then looked almost perfectly at my location. Young wizard knight called Timmy she asked quietly, even leaning forward a little. There was no one around, so I wasn't afraid to expose myself this way. Yes. Please give this letter to Hermione Granger. You know her. Of course Timmy knows. The house elf nodded, accepting the letter. It's not forbidden, is it? Of course not. Timmy will do the young wizard's request now. The house elf shook the envelope and disappeared. Now it remains only to understand what happened and why, and what caused it in the first place. Moving quickly around the castle, not wanting to disturb the alert system with an apparition, which is clearly there and due to which the headmaster reacted so quickly to our movement with Delphine, I moved towards the cluster of Slytherin marks. It turned out to be a spacious abandoned auditorium, into which, despite the charms of privacy, silencing, and locking the doors, I entered easily through the shadow, finding myself in a dark corner. As befits an abandoned classroom, there were dusty old desks and chairs everywhere, but closer to the exit, where the Slytherins had gathered, the desks had been cleaned, and there were students sitting on some of them. The information is absolutely correct. Malfoy glanced at the gathering, 
sitting on one of the desks. That scumbag knight isn't in the castle right now. The perfect time to complete the Dark Lord's errand. The seniors looked at each other, but none of those present seemed to notice Knott's gaze, full of a certain expectation. Malfoy, one of them spoke up. What exactly do you want to do, and what does Granger have to do with it? It's obvious, Malfoy waved his hand to the side. Ah, you weren't there then. The Dark Lord personally instructed me to convey to Greengrass that their mother's refusal to cooperate could have unintended consequences. To frighten them properly. And in order not to waste time on the same thing, I decided to lure this filthy mood blood Granger into the same trap. But in doing so, you're afraid of Knight, the seventh year student, whose name I don't know, nodded with a smirk. Don't be silly, said Malfoy with ill concealed irritation. I'm just avoiding unwanted conflicts with the use of magic, that's all. Yeah, nodded one of the younger ones from the fourth. Do you want to say that it's normal to frighten your own classmates? How could it be otherwise Malfoy jumped down from his desk, looking around the audience. Our house, Slytherin, should be united. It doesn't matter how exactly we achieve this. If in order for the noble pure-blood families of wizards to make the right decision, you need to scare someone a little we will do it. Chapter 360 So, what's it got to do with Granger came the question again. This filthy mood blood thinks too much of herself. Since she communicates with the tournament champion, who won, clearly using some tricks, she believes that she is better than us, pure blood wizards. It doesn't have to be like this. We'll put her in her place, and at the same time, we'll show Knight that it's better not to go against us. And what about you Malfoy looked at everyone with a sneer and a threat. Have you decided to go against the will of the Dark Lord didn't your families assure him of their loyalty? No one is going against him, the seventh year student shook his head negatively. We just need to know what and why. Knowledge is for those whom the Dark Lord considers worthy. Not. Everything is ready. The eldest under Imperio, barely caught a moment in the common room Theodore nodded. She has some common topics on runes with Granger, and I made her arrange a meeting in the same class. The class is prepared, too. Younger sister. Daphne called her to a very important conversation, not for the common room. The same room. I see, nodded Malfoy. Since everything is ready let's move out. Banal logic tells me that their current plan couldn't have ended the way it did, which means something went wrong. But what it could be important. It really could be important. Hidden under the charms and in the shadows, I followed a group of Slytherins who also resorted to the help of hiding charms and invisibility cloaks. There were two of the latter, and only the upperclassmen had known the charms, it took a minute to prepare. But it didn't matter to me whether I could see them or not the marks clearly signaled their location to my consciousness. The other three markers, so far away from this group and from each other, were gradually getting closer. So it's about to start. Say, Malfoy, came a low whisper in the hallway, which was not easily heard because of the slight noise from the movement of the group of Slytherins. Where did the information come from? Can you be quiet the bug on the wings brought it? I was extremely surprised by this answer and it took me a few seconds to comprehend what was said. There's only one bug in magical England, and it loves to carry information on its wings like Santa Claus carries Christmas presents. Her name is Rita Skeeter. Here everything is clear, spies and reports to whoever has more money, along the way collecting various dirt on everybody in order to release some daring articles or gather material for the book, or perhaps several. Problematic person. I have to make a note to deal with it. After a dozen minutes of careful movement through the castle, the group of Slytherins reached a long corridor with several offices. Four stayed behind to keep watch. Here, Malfoy handed them something. The creation of the twins. Eat it, and your nose will bleed. With this, you will immediately distract one of the professors and head to the hospital wing, if necessary. They nodded, and the others quickly went into the classroom. I also went there with the help of shadows. Another abandoned office with dusty tables and chairs, in the corner of which there were three mobile chalkboards next to each other, and the teacher's desk, apparently, was taken away, leaving only a slightly different color spot on the floor. In the middle of this classroom stood Daphne with her wand in her hands and a look of utter indifference. On the floor, next to the blonde, was Astoria, bound along and across, looking at everything with incomprehension, 
and Hermione was standing next to her with her hands down and clearly under the influence of Petri Ficus. Hmm, no, she was just pretending. Ha, unbelievable! Malfoy exclaimed in delight, and nine Slytherins appeared in the office. Imperio, as it turns out, adds to your magic some power. Oxio, Granger's wand, not waved in the air, summoning Hermione's wand from under her robes. He did the same with Astoria and Daphne's wand, handing them over to one of the remaining upperclassmen, Riley, I think, for safekeeping. In the seventh generation, it seems that he is hanging out with, in his opinion, a promising group in terms of power and influence. Harper was a fourth-year student, and the other two from the sixth were Selwyn and Morgan. All just began to be called as wizards according to the radicals of purity of blood six and seven generations. Crab and Goyle need no introduction they are still standing like statues next to Malfoy. There are, by the way, a couple of other Draco sidekicks, but it seems that they are not part of this improvised inner circle. Tell me, Daphne, Nod approached the blonde, and she turned a meaningless look at him. How did you manage so well? Nonverbal wandless Petri Ficus and Incarcero, she replied. Look at the talents she was hiding, Not shook his head. Not waved his wand, and the bound Astoria flew smoothly, landing on one of the chairs. Glancing at Granger, Theodore just waved his hand, considering that it was not worth wasting time on her yet Hermione perfectly plays a person under Petri Ficus. So, Malfoy pulled out a chair from behind the nearest table, sitting down on it. Somebody tie up that blonde, and don't forget Silencio. The question was quickly solved by Knot, with the movement of his wand and a word key, conjuring Incarcero on Daphne and moving the wand near her face, he removed Imperio. The girl's gaze quickly became meaningful and shocked, but she did not have time to say anything, having received Silencio. Daphne, 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 Malfoy shook his head, smirking. It was very reckless of your mother to refuse the Dark Lord. Not to accept his gracious offer. Chapter 361 Malfoy began to rant about what prospects open up from cooperation and what terrible things can await those who refuse this cooperation. So as not to sound unsubstantiated, Malfoy took out his wand and began to play with it in his hand. Oh, I almost forgot. Who will realize that they are wrong maybe Astoria will she watch her sister being tortured, burning with helplessness. The crowd laughed. Maybe dilute the torture with carnal pleasures maybe even Granger will have the happiness to be with a real pure blood wizard instead of pathetic semblance in the form of Night Et. It became clear from the faces of both Daphne and Astoria that they realized the prospects. Malfoy pointed his wand at Astoria. Finita Silencio, what do you think? The brunette, gaining the ability to speak, suddenly looked at Draco extremely seriously. Do you even realize the depth of the hole you're digging for yourself to yourself and your friends? The Slytherins laughed, some faintly, some not. In case you're wondering, I found Skeeter. She's right here in the room, lurking on Goyle's clothes. Leave a mark on her. And what could possibly happen smirked Malfoy, looking at Astoria. What can one housewife do to us loyal followers of the Dark Lord? How little you know, Malfoy. It doesn't matter, Draco drawl lazily. You better imagine what a fun life awaits you from now on. A contract or unbreakable vow of everything that happened in this circle. They will study here for at least another year, and you, too, you will run to persuade your mother to accept the Dark Lord's conditions. Of course, he won't be as merciful as before, but isn't that better than nothing? During the conversation, some of the Slytherins were building up the atmosphere, moving quietly around the victims. Not was paying particular attention to Daphne, who suddenly began to flinch at Not's touch. The guy seemed to casually touch her shoulder, then hair, then hand. Daphne's every flinch was reflected in Knott's face, it annoyed him. Strange. So continued Malfoy. You, Astoria, are kind of the smartest of the two of you. Think how you will persuade your mother, and to think better. Suddenly, Crab, Goyle, and Malfoy were frozen in place by spells flying at their backs. A spell flew at Astoria as well apparently Silencio. After all, Slytherins can do a little more than Gryffindors and at least conjure a couple of spells without words. Now everyone was looking at Selwyn, who had come out into the center between the girls and the paralyzed trio. Sixth year, not the most noticeable guy of ordinary appearance. He nodded to fourth-year student Harper, 
sixth-year student Morgan, Riley, and Knott, who was looking at Malfoy with an undisguised grin. Mutiny aboard. Draco, 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 Selwyn repeated Malfoy's intonation. Over the many years that we have all known you, you have shown yourself terribly. For a long time, we have all shown visible respect for you, counting on further relationships and the influence of your family. However, with Mr. Malfoy's death, all your family is doing is losing. Loses everything, slowly but inexorably. Your behavior and skills have turned away many influential people from you and your family, who now maintain only the appearance of a good relationship with you, continuing to pull money from you. And you're glad. They say you don't listen to your mother, but I heard how she tried to give you good advice. Now that the Dark Lord in his mercy has chosen yours as his home, soon there will be no trace of your money left. Selwyn paced back and forth, thinking aloud. Many people at the house think that your leadership is no longer appropriate. However, we all understand that you can't just be dropped. And then you come with your own, as always, brilliant plan to scare the green grass girls. Although the Dark Lord ordered to convey the idea and not to frighten possible allies. In the end, by a majority vote and on the strong recommendation of Mr. Knott, Selwyn pointed his hand in the direction of Theo. It was decided to discredit you and your two bullies in the eyes of the Dark Lord. Of course, the discrediting will take place according to a very pleasant plan for us we will not scare the girls but go directly to the point. Not chuckled wickedly, continuing to circle over Daphne and not noticing anything. But the others noticed it very much, apparently, Selwyn said thoughtfully, looking at Theo's behavior. Mental abnormalities are hereditary. True, Mr. Knott has become a paranoid maniac, but our poor Theo has become a pervert. Selwyn took a step towards the frightened and shocked Daphne, looking into her eyes. You see, darling, what happens when you don't let a crazy psycho get to sweet? Chapter 362 What I wonder is, if Daphne can do magic without a wand or words, why doesn't she at least try to escape it can't get any worse? But that's a matter of the psyche, I suppose. Imperio is a powerful thing, and you can get some pretty unusual results with it. Selwyn turned back to Malfoy. You probably want to ask something, don't you but don't worry, your questions are obvious. First, so that the green grass girls get a sense of the whole situation, we'll show them visually, using mood blood, for example, what awaits them. Then we'll use on them obliviate with memory modification, where you and your mates will do all sorts of nasty things to them, saying, by order of the Dark Lord, that sort of thing. That way, the mood blood along with the hated knight, will suffer, green grass will finally turn their back on the dark lord, which he will certainly blame you for. Then the sights of both him and green grass will converge on you, and that's it, goodbye, Draco. Selwyn uttered the last word so much in the style of Pansy Parkinson that half of the guys shuddered. And as a bonus it's no secret that knight is Narcissa's son. When Lady Greengrass finds out who abused her daughters, the relationship with knight will radically deteriorate, and he will lose his support in the face of their family. You know what's funny his birthday is the 5th of June. Funny, isn't it just like yours? I'll bet that the late Mr. Lucius did something crazy and got rid of your brother. Hmm, and it's possible that Mr. Malfoy didn't die by accident, but here it is already necessary to make inquiries a little deeper than casually through the Ministry's files. Selwyn was clearly intrigued by the idea that had just appeared in his head. Selwyn called out Harper to him. Ah, yes. Selwyn turned his attention back to Malfoy. We'll mess with your memory, too, but the cause will be a love potion with a couple of undocumented properties. You know how hard silly Parkinson tries to get that potion into you, don't you, and now everything will be as if she threw you a bottle with a delayed release. But, unfortunately, another failure, though now it will bring the beloved Draco to the grave. Selwyn shook his head looking at the immobilized boys. I feel sorry for her even. You better do it with her already, or she'll become like Not. Anyway, I think everyone understood everything. Not put his hand on Daphne's chest, albeit through the rope, immediately drawing Selwyn's attention. Not. He shouted, stopping Theo and forcing him to remove his hand. Daphne sobbed soundlessly. I understand that it's not every day that you have a wonderful opportunity to touch such outstanding talents, but first, Granger. Girls need to shake their psyche a little for easier exposure to spells. 
Selwyn took out his wand and pointed at Hermione, who was still pretending to be paralyzed. Shall we wake the beauty with the Cruciatus why am I asking, though crew? Hermione sat down abruptly and, with a wave of her hand, silently sent a bombarda at Selwyn. The spell is scary when it hits not a person but a hard surface next to him. There was an explosion, and Selwyn, who was not expecting such a situation, was thrown into the wall like a broken doll. Not, who had just returned to groping Daphne's chest, stood looking at what had happened in shock. Draco and his bullies freed themselves from paralysis, apparently due to a surge of adrenaline. They snatched out their wands, and Hermione had already conjured Protego Maxima, strengthening it with Fiantuduri. Dropping to one knee, the girl touched the floor with her hand, launching transfiguration a stone rod grew out of the floor next to Riley, who was already preparing to attack, and hit him, grabbing Hermione's wand. The rod went to the floor, and after a brief moment, multicolored rays of spells began to crash into the girl's defense. Now that Hermione has a wand in her hands, and the first Cruciatus has almost appeared, I decided to join the fight, though that wasn't quite right. Rowena. Take your architect form and kick the crap out of everyone here. And the ones outside, too. Yeah, easily. A black female silhouette formed behind Hermione's back, beginning to form various small blunt objects from the shadows, inexorably throwing them at the opponents. Hermione twitched at first but quickly realized whose side the unknowing thing was on. Rowena's black figure took a couple of spells on her shield from the shadows, thereby covering Hermione and finally assuring her that it was possible to get out from defensive mode. She left Protego's protection with quick dancing movements, dispelling it, and Rowena followed her, not forgetting to protect her from flying spells. Dodge, spell back, defense, dodge, Hermione's oversaturated stupefy exploded in a heap of blue blobs, hitting everything, but only a quarter hit the Slytherins or their defense. Rowena throws objects at opponents from the shadows, breaking their limbs, ribs, noses, fingers. Sometimes, as if by accident, she drops something on them several times in a row, such as a furniture. A couple of stray spells almost hit Daphne and Astoria, but Rowena covered them, transfiguring the protection from the shadow with a dash of hemomancy energy to completely disperse and absorb the magic put in them. The fight lasted less than 15 seconds, after which Rowena went through the wall, and in another five seconds, the broken bodies of the four on guard flew through the door. Daphne seemed to have somehow managed to free herself in Astoria and was now standing pale in the corner of the classroom, not knowing where to point her wand, while Astoria, much calmer, tried to soothe her sister by gently touching her arm. Still standing in the corner, hidden in the shadows, I transfigured a scrap of paper out of the air, still using the same magic to write a message for myself which I would pass on through Hermione. I handed the message to her, materializing it in the hands of the black figure of Rowena, and she handed it to the girl, disappearing. Here the matter is resolved. What's next? Chapter 363 Leaving the office through the shadows, I walked quickly towards another magical mark that was gradually moving away. You won't catch up. Well, guess again. Having oversaturated stupefy with magic, I created only one beam, sending it after the target. I don't need echolocation I can already imagine where the little bug is because I know the castle by heart. Well, at least the places I've been to. As I thought, the beam found its target, even though I had to control its flight blindly. In twenty seconds of running through the stone corridors of the castle, I reached my goal a paralyzed beetle was lying on the floor. Turning it into a statue of a beetle, I put it in my pocket and went back to the office where they incident occurred. Upon my return, a rather entertaining picture was waiting for me. Hermione stood next to Daphne and tried to calm her down. Actually, Astoria was doing the same thing. Professor McGonagall and Snape had just begun to levitate a bunch of victims behind them, moving towards the hospital wing, and Dumbledore with Umbridge were hovering over Hermione. While the headmaster looked studyingly at both the situation with traces of combat and some characteristic magical traces of spatial transfiguration, Umbridge reprimanded the girls with all her heart. Unthinkable, Miss Granger! exclaimed this plump, stunted lady in yet another pink business-style combination. Twelve pure-blood wizards from old and powerful families have suffered at your hands today. Two children from the families of the trustees, two from the Wizengamot. It was self-defense. Hermione snapped angrily. 
Do you really, Miss Granger? Umbridge's voice didn't have those sugary notes with which she likes to spice up any of her speech. Think anyone would care remember those paragraphs that relate to situations that require the practical application of such spells and restrictions related to reasonable self-defense. Hermione looked at Umbridge very angrily. Your anger won't help here. These paragraphs are the official position of the ministry, and there is a tangible excess of permissible self-defense. But they wanted. It doesn't matter what they wanted. Umbridge raised her tone a little. Whether for good or not, but we, in England, do not judge for intentions. Dolores. The headmaster spoke but was immediately interrupted by Umbridge. And with you, headmaster, I will have a separate conversation during which I would like to hear about why at the school under your leadership happening something like. Umbridge waved her hand vaguely. All this. During my learning, headmaster, Rods protected young minds from crazy thoughts better than any acclumency. And all this kind of stuff was already happening outside of Hogwarts. The important thing is that it wasn't at Hogwarts, you, Umbridge looked sternly at the girls. Daphne almost calmed down. Proceed to the hospital wing. You. Miss Granger, should think about what serious consequences the relatives of these children can create for you, both personally and through the ministry. But. You have exceeded the permissible self-defense, this is the position of the ministry. I have a mentor. I hope, Umbridge smiled sweetly. He is not afraid of difficulties because the parents of these children will try to bring hell to a muggle-born witch. The girls, the headmaster, and Umbridge went towards the hospital wing, and I. I still have about an hour to make the most of it. Quickly reaching one of the vacant rooms, I locked myself in there properly and, taking the statue of the bug out of my pocket, returned it to its original living form, paralyzing it with magic. Then I pointed my wand at the beetle and activated a reversing spell designed to return the animagus to its original appearance. The bug almost instantly grew to an already familiar shocking blonde, Rita Skeeter herself. Disarming her, taking her bag and wand with telekinesis, I returned the ability to speak. Let me go immediately, boy, Rita hissed angrily, shaking her head, causing her glasses to tilt a little. The outfit now, as always, shone with poorly compatible bright acid colors in shades of pink and green. Although, I've seen far stranger things. You will listen to me carefully, Miss Skeeter, I squatted across from the woman lying on the floor, simultaneously asking Rowena to scare her. Listen and respond. Rowena coped with the task, judging by Rita's incredibly panicked eyes. So. Blaming you for bringing any information to whoever is paying is silly. I have a question how do I get into the Wisengamot Heritage Hall? Rita blinked stupidly for a few seconds until the essence of the question reached her. Um. I can show you the way she asked uncertainly. Absolutely. So. I will, she nodded, pulling herself together and reaching for her things. But I moved them by telekinesis behind my back and then put them in my bag to the all potentially dangerous shit. Can I have my things? No. With a blow of my hand, I broke off a piece of stone from the wall, causing Skeeter to hiccup, and with a slight movement of my wand, I began to enchant the port Kaya to Whitehall Street. It took only a dozen seconds, during which Rita Skeeter watched me closely. I almost forgot, I smiled turning her into a statuette and putting it in the pocket of my suit. After all, I can't carry you in my arms. Chapter 364 I put on my disguise, accelerated to the maximum, and left Hogwarts in just a couple of minutes, immediately activating the port Kaya and moving to the entrance to the ministry I knew on the ordinary people's side, to the phone box. There's another one, but I'm not going to wash off. I quickly reached the phone box and dialed 62442 on an old-fashioned disc machine. You don't have to hold the receiver to your ear, the voice comes from all directions. Welcome to the Ministry of Magic. Please state your name and the purpose of your visit. Max Sterlitz. I'm going to hurry things up. Thank you, the synthetic female voice replied. Visitor, please take your badge and attach it to the front of your robe. There was a click from the coin return chute, then a silver badge with the inscription Max Sterlitz. In a hurry. As I attached the badge and listened to another instruction from the synthetic voice that I would need to weigh my wand, I prepared to descend. The phone box worked like an elevator, and after a few rather boring moments, I got out into a spacious and long hall with a black parquet floor, 
black tiles on the walls, and many gilded fireplaces along the entire room. Golden symbols shone on the iridescent blue ceiling, which moved and changed, making the ceiling look like a huge celestial bulletin board. There were quite a few wizards here. A little further on, this long, long hall was divided in two by a circular room that looked like a mine and stretched up a couple of dozen levels from glazed balconies. There was a fountain in the middle of the hall with a sculpture depicting the greatness of wizards, or rather, self-aggrandizement over the rest. But that wasn't where I was going, I was going to a small table with the inscription security. There, at the table, sat a badly shaven wizard of dubious appearance, and he was engaged in weighing wands and writing down. I gave my second wand, and I was registered as Max Sterlitz so it says on the badge, what could he do going behind an inconspicuous corner, I cast a distracting spell and, taking out a statuette of Rita from my pocket, returned her to the former appearance. She wanted to be indignant, but I restored her decent appearance with a couple of spells, straightening her wrinkled clothes and returning the glasses to the place where they should be. Lead on, I said shortly, and Rita didn't dare to be indignant. And yes, I know you understand, but I'll tell you anyway. I was walking next to her, and there was nothing in my hands the main wand was in a holster, and the second one was in a reduced cane that rests in a special pocket. No nonsense, Miss Skeeter. A slight volitional impact on the architect's abilities, and Skeeter's heart skipped a beat or two, causing the woman to nearly pass out, but I held her by the elbow. She seemed to shake off the stray thoughts. We traveled around the ministry for at least fifteen minutes either by elevators or on foot, now and then politely nodding to tired wizards in strict suits and robes. In the end, our route ended up with massive double-leaf doors. The main meeting room of the Wizengamot, Skeeter explained, glancing warily in my direction. For organizational matters, this is where they gather. The Heritage Hall is a small open room above the hall, supported by arches. I can't even imagine what you might need there. Without further ado, I turned Skeeter back into a statue, hiding it in my pocket. Rowena, can you scout I'll try. A black shadow slid from under my feet and soaked into the floor, and a minute later, Rowena's voice rang in my head. A hall like a hall. A semicircle of stands amphitheatrically, with a large patch of ancient esoteric symbolism in the middle. The hall itself is round, and six arches go up from the walls to the ceiling, forming a small platform. There, as I understand it, are separate flying discs, but you can get there this way. In the middle is what you need. Excellent. Walk me through the shadow with an apparition I can screw it up myself. There is protection here, isn't there yes, but it's not a problem. Hold on. I didn't have to hold on I just fell into the shadow. From another visual interpretation of the world around me, my head ached a little, but Rowena quickly spit out me onto a poorly lit hexagon of the floor, in the middle of which a large quartz crystal stood on a pedestal. It glowed slightly pink, and inside, you could see many thousands of runes woven into intricate contours, moving inside, and it seemed that some appeared and others disappeared as if dying. Remembering that after the ritual by which I was saved from lycanthropy, the ring of the head of the house began to appear, as soon as I wished, I used this function. The ring appeared on the ring finger, not particularly intricate and with a somewhat simplified but still recognizable skull against the black coat of arms background. Without further ado, I leaned the ring against the crystal, feeling the magical vibrations that had begun. The light slowly flared up inside the crystal the smallest runes lit up. The light acquired a soft yellow hue, and after a dozen seconds, it changed to green, identification was successful, House Black received their head in the Wizen Gamot, although no one knows who exactly. This gives me the opportunity from the point of view of who has the longest to argue with many wizards, not allowing myself to be pressured by the official authority. There was a mere trifle left. I took my bag off my shoulder and pulled out another blank piece of parchment, quill, and ink, no magic would work here. I quickly wrote a simple statement on behalf of Head of House Black, just like that, and no other way around. The essence of the statement, from now on, Maximilian Knight has the right to handle all the affairs of House Black and represent its interests in Wizengamot. Lord Black. That's all and the imprint of the activated and identified ring of the head works instead of a signature. Now I can actually do whatever I need or should do as the actual head of the house, but at the same time being only its representative, and this is social weight. A representative of myself. Interesting, but most importantly, it works. 
and what kind of ring I have there not everyone will understand. Chapter 365 Leaning the parchment against the quartz crystal, I held it with a ring, the quartz crystal blinked, the parchment disappeared, but two more appeared next to the crystal. One of them smoothly flew off in an unknown direction, perhaps to some filing cabinet, and the second, apparently, is intended for me. Taking the parchment and putting it in my bag, I hurried to leave the ministry there was no time left. I got out much faster, and when there were ten minutes left to get back to Hogwarts, I was already standing on the street, looking at the night-lit sky over London. Apparition and now I'm already on the border with Hogwarts. Concealment charms, maximum acceleration, and run, run. Well, under maximum acceleration, I can easily catch up with those who fly on the firebolt, catch up and laugh, catch up and... Stress has a negative effect on your thought process. Stress, in general, has a negative effect, though you can't do without it. Three minutes before the right time, I ran into one of the empty dead-end corridors of the castle, took a statue of Skeeter out of my pocket, and returned her to human form. Before she could protest, I pointed my wand at her. Obliviate, I uttered the verbal formula of the spell, putting in a clear statement, erase the last month. Without any sampling. Rita's eyes glazed over, but the process goes very quickly, a dozen seconds. I took her things out of my bag with my telekinesis, returned her wand in a special pocket, put the bag on my shoulder, and went to the headmaster's office under the spell of concealment. I found myself in front of the gargoyle just as it moved aside, opening the passage to the staircase that Dumbledore was descending. I've done everything, headmaster. Done what he looked at me questioningly. You know, Mr. Knight. I'm in a hurry to the hospital wing. You might want to check on your friend. If I hadn't noticed the sly glint in the headmaster's eyes a few seconds later, I would have thought that I had got somewhere wrong. What a joke. We went to the hospital wing, and on the way, unnoticed by a possible observer, I returned the time-turner to the headmaster. He also imperceptibly, as if he had been doing nothing but passing the shifts under the table all his life, accepted the trinket and hid it in the sleeve of his purple robe. Did you learn anything interesting? Apart from the fact that nothing really bad happened, and Slytherin House is no longer satisfied with Malfoy as a leader no. No wonder, the headmaster shook his head. I'm talking about Mr. Malfoy, given his character and abilities, it was only a matter of time, but, frankly, I assumed this only in the sixth year. Headmaster, may I ask you a question? Dumbledore nodded, and we walked out into the stairwells. Why aren't you using that thing? That's your personal opinion, Mr. Knight, the headmaster smiled, but a second later, his smile was gone. The scariest thing about owning this thing is the overwhelming urge to try to fix something. For example, some tragedy happened half an hour ago, and you have this thing in your hands. It seems to you that it's only worth turning, just one turn. But the trouble is, it's already happened, so there's no point in turning it. Decided to turn but failed, did not have time, or even turned out to be the culprit. If you didn't turn it it seems as if it was you who allowed this tragedy. In any case, the burden of guilt itself gets on your shoulders. Once, twice, ten times. Possession of such an artifact is terrible torture because nothing can be changed. But in such cases as yours, as you can see for yourself, it has a certain benefit. At the end of his speech, the headmaster smiled and we reached the hospital wing. Once again, we had to walk through the rows of moaning wounded, the names of the special figures of whom I remembered, yes. I remembered well. Having reached the curtained shelter of the three girls, Dumbledore coughed tactfully and asked if we could come in. Daphne had already calmed down and was lying quietly in bed, pulling the blanket over her head. Astoria and Hermione were playing dead calm, and it looked like potions were involved. Lady Greengrass was sitting in the chair beside Daphne's bed, holding her hand out from under the covers. Hermione. I turned to the girl. She shifted her gaze to me, smiling stupidly and almost imperceptibly. Ah. Uh -huh. Max. Dumbledore looked at everyone, noted faintly that it would be necessary to moderate Madame Pomfrey's ardor in doses of sedatives. Hermione. If anyone comes to you with complaints about what happened, feel free to send them all to me. Even if Merlin and Morgana come. No problem. Hermione nodded and slowly shifted her surprised gaze to Astoria sitting next to her. 
Can you imagine? I just noted so hard. Astoria sat there, not reacting to anything, and after a couple of seconds, turned to Hermione. You're, a cactus. Right. I looked at Delphine, she was adequate and thinking about something very important. If you go crusading on them, call me. Delphine just nodded, continuing to think about her own thing, and I left this wonderful place. We need to develop a plan and strike already, undercutting the capabilities of the Dark Lord and his minions. Special attention should be paid to Nott. From the looks of it, he's a lunatic. That's a lot worse than Draco, at least he's just a fool. Chapter 366 A problem requires a solution, this is obvious. There are many possible solutions, but each entails certain consequences. Revenge should be inconspicuous, but the situation should be public. Will the relatives of the injured attackers be inactive? Certainly not. So, we need to work ahead of the curve. Once again, put on a complex of concealing charms and went through the dark night corridors away from the castle. I had no trouble getting past all the main places where I could see the teachers patrolling the castle, and then I made my way outside. Inhaling the cold air of late autumn, I straightened my coat, scarf, and ran off to the border of Hogwarts' anti-apparition charms. Having gone a little deeper into the Forbidden Forest, I felt that it was possible to apparate, immediately moving to the house's threshold on Grimald Place. Without hesitating for a second, I went inside, simultaneously taking off my concealment charms, which slightly scared Kriaker, who was cleaning. The old house elf almost jumped on the spot, holding a black and white feather duster in his hands. Dear head! He bowed, but seeing my haste, hurried to stand with his back to the wall letting me down the corridor into the hall with Lady Walburga's portrait. Good night, I nodded in response to the surprised look. What a youth these days, complained the painted witch, lighting a cigarette in the mouthpiece. Just give them a reason to skip Hogwarts. The matter is urgent. Listening carefully, Walburga spoke more seriously, blowing a couple of rings of drawn smoke. An incident has occurred. In short, in order to teach a lesson, Twelve Slytherins decided to scare the green grass daughters, and along the way, my friend. As a result, there was a riot, a split, an uprising in their ranks, and in order to discredit some families in the eyes of the Dark Lord, it was decided not to frighten but to implement threats of a sexual nature. It ended well for the girls and a hospital wing for the attackers. Something doesn't add up here, replied Walburga calmly. Well, as I know. The Dark Lord ordered to hold a conversation with the girls, and Malfoy decided to hold a frightening and threatening conversation. The rebels decided to embody the threats, and by potions and oblivion to expose everything in such a light that Malfoy himself came up with and implemented the plan in this form. I understand. You don't have to tell me any more. An ordinary and too rough adventure that could not end well. Perhaps it was not the most reasonable decision on the part of the former Lord Greengrass to conceal that long ago incident as well as its consequences. And how severe are the Slytherin's injuries? Fractures, bruises, stuff like that, I waved my hand indefinitely in the air. Nothing serious. Hmm. Walburga looked at me thoughtfully. Sometimes I forget, she spoke, putting aside the mouthpiece and cigarette, that you were not raised in the magical world. Various bruises and fractures, as well as many other easily recoverable injuries, are considered minor injuries. Destruction of organs or body parts that did not cause death and were not the result of curses or dark magic, medium. If it can't be healed, it's severe. In fact, even simple curses like Slugulus Erupto come close to medium severity because of the fact that it's a curse. But can they inflate an incredibly loud case out of the incident? Of course. You can inflate the tragedy even from the little finger bruised on the corner of the bedside table. What are you going to do? I want to be the first to present materials for the DMLE and the Ministry in a favorable light for me. That's right. In this case, the main thing is to correctly place accents. Just talk to Delphine beforehand about whether publicity is permissible. Perhaps she will decide to strike herself, and it will be completely different. Her father had already done this, an apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say. They have always been a peaceful family but it's worth poking them harder than you won't collect bones. But in general, in order to arrange everything correctly, I recommend contacting one lawyer. For two and a half centuries, 
their family has successfully dealt with our problems, stumbling only over the imprisonment of Sirius in Azkaban. In those days, the ministry generally spat on its own laws, just to imprison more of those who were considered to be involved in the Death Eaters. I see. Address. Kriakar. The house elf immediately appeared beside me, staring expectantly at Walburga's portrait and at me. Write down Mr. Goober's address. The house elf disappeared with a bow, only to reappear a dozen seconds later, holding an even piece of parchment in his hands, handing it to me. Well done, Kriakar. Thank you, Lady Walburga. You're not going to leave right now, are you the rules of decorum require? Rules require, and circumstances determine. We must not delay. Also true. But I would like you to leave a good impression of yourself at the first acquaintance. I'll leave a good reward, better than any impression. Debatable, but more than fair for some people. Kriakar. Give Max a thousand galleons, Lady Walburga had not yet finished speaking, and the house elf disappeared. This is quite enough for a case of such complexity, plus a bonus for urgency and a night visit. Chapter 367 Taking a bag of money from Kriakar, who appeared, I left the house, walking to the dark alley from which I usually apparate. That's exactly what I did this time, but I had to apparate as much as four blocks to the address I needed I simply haven't been there yet. Moving at a moderately fast pace through the streets of a residential area of London at night, I took a two-way mirror out of my pocket. Only now I realized that I had not cast a muggle repellent charm, and taking out my wand, unnoticed by a possible observer, corrected this issue as soon as I entered the shadow of the house. Tapping my wand on the mirror, I put it back in the holster on my forearm and waited for an answer. For a dozen seconds, I had to just go and look at the mirror, but my reflection was replaced by Tongsa's sleepy face, wrapped in a blanket. She was clearly lying in bed, and with a sleepy look full of discontent, she was trying to focus on me. She succeeded pretty quickly. Hey, um. Wanted something, huh it's the middle of the night. You know em yes. Tonks's eyes began to close, so I resorted to emergency measures, copying Moody's voice. Wake up, or Tonks. I barked into the mirror. Tonks immediately jumped up on the bed and apparently stood on it with her feet. She was dressed in some sort of dimensionless pink shirt and around I could make out a quite ordinary but old-fashioned room for one person. Nymphadora looked at me with her eyes wide open, holding a mirror at arm's length in front of her. Her gaze cleared quickly, and the girl was about to give out an angry speech, as evidenced by her flushed hair, but I beat her to it. Help and consultation are required. Right now. RRR. Nymphadora literally crushed the incipient curses, quickly coming back to normal and sitting down on the bed. Tell me. I outlined the situation in a nutshell. How to make an application to the DMLE quickly. Oh, it's a lot of bureaucracy. You'll sit there all day. And there's no reception tomorrow. Um. Weekend it's a law enforcement agency. That's the norm, isn't it? No. I don't know, Tonks shrugged. Duty officers and patrols work, but the application has to go through a bunch of departments, and they don't work. I see. Then I need your help. Can you arrange and register everything by passing the bureaucracy? And how do you imagine it Tonks was quite seriously indignant, although I can see from the look that she is also worried about the current situation. I will come to the ministry and immediately to the head of the DMLE for a signature. Even so, I nodded. I'm a junior orer, Max. I don't have such privileges. Arrogance is the second happiness. Take Moody with you and storm the office you need. He may be crazy, but he can get in all the doors. I owe you a favor. Tonks clearly imagined this process and was noticeably depressed. I need a parchment with your signature because there will be a statement on your behalf. Yes, as the victim's mentor. Mentor so you're already an apprentice in what Nymphadora asked much more lively, changing her hair color a couple of times. Master of Transfiguration, Miss Tonks, I held up my hand with the ring. Oh. Wow. Tonks jumped up from the bed. But. How wow. It's a secret between you and me, Nymphadora. Upon hearing her name, Tonks was about to be outraged, and even her hair turned scarlet, but seeing my serious face, she only smirked. Excellent, Master Knight. One more thing. 
We don't know if the other two girls, or rather their relatives, will decide to make things public. Then two parchments with a signature, the chapeau statement, addressed to the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement Amelia Bones, outlining the events and the essence of the statement on both options. Attached documents. I'll let you know later. Good. Write, fill out, send. When you decide on the list of documents and applications, send certified copies, we will write them down. I'll fill out the rest on the way. Great. I'll be in touch. Closing the mirror, I looked around I almost reached the right apartment building. It seems that not only the blacks settled in the city at one time. The right house was somewhat similar to the one on Grimwald Place, but at the same time, the neighborhood was clearly richer, and the facades tidier. Fresh window frames, clean brick walls, a well-groomed and pleasant backyard with a playground and everything like that, a view of which opened from around the corner of the house. As I thought, the door I needed, unlike the others in this house, was the entrance to the apartment and not to the stairs with apartments. Using a massive metal ring, I knocked on the door. There was no answer. Waiting. Nobody. I knocked again. The door creaked open, and a middle-aged house elf poked his head out. Although he wore a toga made of a white sheet, he looked almost like an emperor. Late guests are highly undesirable in the house of the esteemed Mr. Goober, the house elf spoke reproachfully, nodding a couple of times at the end, adding importance to his words. A matter of urgent importance. Extra galleons for inconveniences. Tell him, esteemed house elf, that Mr. Goober is being called by a representative of the Black House. The esteemed house elf was imbued with the fact that he was esteemed, hesitated a little, but opened the door wider, inviting me in. Chapter 368 Esteemed house elf, he said, asks the distinguished guest to go into the living room to wait and asks to observe decency. This means to keep the wand with me, and if necessary, call him. How can I address you it was hard to restrain a smile. Judging by his eyes, the house elf is perfectly familiar with the concept of flattery, but he couldn't do anything with himself. It seems that he didn't receive a direct order not to let anyone in. Willie. A distinguished guest can contact Willie if he needs anything. The house elf took me to a not very spacious room, filled with various massive wooden furniture of dark shades. There was everything you needed for a living room. Sofas with thick upholstery, coffee tables, large bookcases, and everything else. The decoration of the hall was also dark, and the wood in it dominated the wallpaper. There were candlesticks on the walls, but now only the fire in the massive fireplace illuminated the room, and the windows, curtained with thick heavy curtains, did not let in a ray of light from street lamps. I sat down on one of the armchairs, staring at the fire in the fireplace. It is strange, but such massive, Medium pretentious furniture, the smell of the same wood, books, and parchment, created along with the fireplace, an atmosphere of gloomy comfort and tranquility. The slightly shuffling footsteps behind me brought me out of my contemplative state. I got up from the armchair and looked around at the source of the sound. An elderly, slightly hunched man in a tightly wrapped terry dark robe, with pajama pants visible beneath, and simple slippers on his feet, walked into the hall. I hope he said in a tired voice, and I noticed his clean-shaven face, already covered with wrinkles. The young man does not count on decent hospitality at a late hour, a good person doesn't go to other people's houses. Mr. Goober I am Maximilian Knight, a representative of the House of Black in the Wisengamot. However, they don't know about it yet. The old man smirked, stepped closer, and held out his hand. Eric Goober, lawyer. We shook hands and sat down on the chairs opposite each other. I don't offer tea or coffee there is no use in them at such a late time. Shoes. At your discretion, Herr Goober. The old man nodded, and two glasses of pomegranate juice appeared in front of us. Good for health, Goober picked up a glass, and I repeated his action, checking the drink with magic. Clear. So, young man, what need has brought you to my house? First of all, I would like to make sure that you are exactly the one I need. The old man smirked again, and with an illusionist's gesture, took out several parchments from his sleeve, certified with many seals. Licenses, various certificates, but my attention was attracted by a rather old contract with several signatures in a column. Opposite each signature was an imprint of the Black's Ring. I am familiar with such a contract, 
for the provision of various services. Its verification is extremely simple the holder of the house ring or other related artifact, for example, which certifies the powers of the wearer, simply takes the contract with his hand on one side, and the one with whom the contract is signed on the other. As a result, the name of the person who signed it should light up. Taking the contract in my hands, I handed it to Mr. Goober. He touched it, and Eric Goober's signature lit up on the parchment. Putting the documents together, I handed them to Mr. Goober, and only after that I sipped pomegranate juice, tart, and insanely sweet and sour. It had been a long time since I drank such a concentrate of quality. Well, it's like this. It took half an hour to tell all the nuances of the current situation, of course, under a non-disclosure agreement. Although, Mr. Goober complained that the contract itself implies such conditions, but how should I know, since I was brought up among ordinary people? Yes, Mr. Goober knew me and my name, tournament, no wonder. So, Mr. Goober spoke after my story, you, young man, decided to take the first step certainly a wise choice. I, as follows from the contract, will give you my support. However, in order to make a correct and competent statement, I will need something. Chapter 369 I spent about an hour at Mr. Goober's house. During this time, we discussed all the nuances of the forthcoming case, compiled a list of necessary appendices to the statement and other materials, compiled the statements themselves in two copies, the work on one of which will depend on Lady Greengrass's decision regarding publicity. After that, using Mr. Goober's owl, I sent copies of the statements to Nymphadora and, leaving the money to the lawyer, I went back to Hogwarts. Sneaking under the spell of secrecy into the castle, I was in some anticipation of what was to come. Anticipation and apprehension at the same time. But all unnecessary thoughts were put aside when I, in the middle of the night, entered the hospital wing of Hogwarts. Lady Greengrass was still there, holding the hand of a calmed and asleep Daphne. Hermione and Astoria were also already sleeping in their assigned beds, so I transfigured a chair next to Delphine's chair and cast a privacy spell around us. I have just one question, mentor, I spoke quietly, trying not to create unnecessary noise even through the privacy charms. Is publicity permissible in this matter? Delphine looked at me with some incomprehension, but rubbing the thick braid of almost white hair thrown over her shoulder, she understood the meaning of my question. Are you up to something and yes, acceptable? It's not like anything happened. Nothing special. Just a preemptive strike through the wizen gamut. It is unlikely that there will be a tangible sense, but there will still be some result. You, as I can see by your eyes, are also up to something. Yes. But this is somewhat different. You said I could call for you in case of anything, right? Yes. Then I may need your help. I'll let you know, Delphine nodded importantly. Good. I need something from the girls right now, and unfortunately, we have to wake them up. I'll do it. Come back in a couple of minutes. I quietly walked away, closing the white screen behind me, and stepped stealthily toward Madame Pomfrey's office. After knocking on the door and waiting for an answer, I went inside. Madame Pomfrey's office looked more like a warehouse of various potions, bandages, and other medical equipment, and Madame Pomfrey herself, sitting at a separate table, looked like an intendant. Mr. Knight the Gaunt Witch looked at me in a surprised and stern manner. Why aren't you in bed yet? I need your help, Madame Pomfrey. Whom something happened? Absolutely. For a possible disciplinary hearing on the case, which will be initiated any minute, the diagnostic results of all the participants are required. The twelve guys you know from Slytherin, Miss Astoria, Daphne Greengrass, and Miss Granger. Madame Pomfrey looked at me extremely surprised. I'm sorry, Mr. Knight. But I can only give them to representatives of the DMLE or Orlers. Or by official order to a member of the Wisengamot. I don't need to pick them up, I smiled. I just want to make sure of their authenticity and certify it. Certify it. As a member of the Wisengamot from the House of Black. I pulled the appropriate parchment from my pocket, and Madame Pomfrey touched it with her wand making sure of its authenticity. Well. That's acceptable. Madame Pomfrey got up from the table and walked over to the filing cabinet I hadn't noticed before. Pulling out one of the drawers that seemed endless, she began methodically searching for the folders she needed, taking out sheets of parchment from there. 
when she had fifteen sheets in her hands, she slid the drawer back and returned to the table, putting them in front of me. The verification procedure is simple I hold one end of the parchment, Madame Pomfer the other. This is how the signature and seal of the healer are manifested. Master Healer. Interesting. Although I did not read the text of the conclusions, but I saw them, which means I remembered it. All are original, and I didn't learn anything new there. Bodily injuries of varying complexity, but light according to the local classification. The girls have stress, abrasions, bruises, and Daphne has an almost disappeared trace of Imperio. As I noted at the tournament, and in the books before that, the Imperio's trace can only be detected within a very short period of time after its disappearance, but paradoxically, it cannot be diagnosed at the moment of the unforgivable without knowing the patient's initial mental data. If at least an hour had passed from the moment of removal from Daphne Imperio and before hospitalization, it would have been impossible to find traces of the spell. Approximately the same situation developed in the early 80s, when real Death Eaters lied by saying that they allegedly acted under Imperio, it was impossible to prove it, and Verita Serum will not answer these questions because a man under Imperio does not know how and why he acted so and not otherwise. Having made sure of the authenticity of all the diagnostics that Madame Pomfrey is obliged to perform when someone goes to the hospital wing, I put the sheets in a separate folder. Having found a red block of magic sealing wax on the table of our healer, I sprinkled a couple of drops from it onto the folder, attaching my ring with coat of arms to it. Verum, Wizen Gamot Sr. All the protocol phrases are in mangled Latin. At least it's not in French, which became popular in the Middle Ages. Thank you. Madame Pomfrey. Either my lawyer, Herr Goober, or the DMLE can come for copies. Madame Pomfrey just nodded, putting the folder in the desk drawer, and I left her office, walking back through the hospital wing, back behind the screen to the girls. Chapter 370 When I returned, all the girls were awake and looking quite calm, and Delphine was still sitting on the bed next to Daphne. She seemed to be the one who needed her mother's support the most. Girls, I understand that I'm asking you for not the nicest thing, but I need a memory of what happened. In the most complete form. Who knows how to extract them? Hermione nodded without further ado and took the wand from the bedside table, touched it with the tip of her temple while closing her eyes. For a couple of seconds, she sat motionless on the bed in this position, after which she slowly began to pull a glowing blue thread from her temple with a wand. Lady Greengrass used permanent transfiguration and created three vials. When Hermione had finished with the manipulation, and a glowing blue thread hung freely in space on the tip of her wand, Delphine brought a vial to the girl, into which the thread was put. Manipulations to extract memories from the green grass girls were carried out personally by their mother and took a little longer. You do know, Delphine spoke up, handing me the three vials of memories, that this is not evidence in court. Absolutely, I nodded, taking the vials and folding them in my inner coat pocket but they are needed not so much as evidence. Delphine nodded and gestured for me to follow her. Stepping outside behind the screen, Lady Greengrass conjured up a privacy charm around us. Max. This is serious. I can't take the girls out of school. It is only possible to transfer from the new academic year, and this is an immutable rule. But what about the visiting guests at the tournament they studied with us? The lists were certified in the summer, and the same summer, the documents on their enrollment in Hogwarts as temporary students were certified. I know what you're thinking the headmaster also can't terminate the contract without a really good reason. What happened is not it, as it would not have been, if what these scum planned had happened. Delphine's voice was deadly calm, which indicates that the occlumency of the mental and emotional processes was taken under maximum control. This is bad. An action like this could happen again, only the meaning would be different and the organization better. That's right. That's why I'd like to ask you to look after the girls. I'll do my best. Turning around, I left the hospital wing, not forgetting to hide myself with various charms before leaving. I came up with a plan in my head on how to influence the Slytherins, but for this, I need to get into the Chamber of Secrets, which is not a problem. Again making my way through the dark corridors, trying to avoid meetings with teachers, Filch or Mrs. Norris. I reached the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets through the office on the fifth floor, and descending into the hall by a spiral staircase and going out into the middle of this, without exaggeration, majestic place, I began to conjure. 
With the help of the materialized energy of Hemamansi, I carved a complex ritual scheme on the floor in the center of the hall, and as objects of influence, I chose twelve Slytherin marks that were now lying on beds in the hospital wing of the castle. A long recitative of distorted phrases in Latin poured out of my mouth by itself, and Rowena helped me not to lose my way in this complex spell. The curse of death in a dream. Of course, I was not going to kill them, but using a weakened version of the ritual and the mental message in attempt to abuse Astoria Greengrass, Daphne Greengrass, Hermione Granger will lead to terrible, nightmarish tortures, deaths, and the death of the family, I will definitely be able to achieve a wonderful effect of unconscious and strong fear for their lives in these individuals, for the appearance of which they will only have to look at them, and if they wish to harm, uh uh. Adding another message, Max Knight is scary, dangerous, cruel, and merciless, I poured enough magic into the diagram, remembering to set up a delayed activation via a simple rune chant outside the diagram. As soon as the magic ends in this binding, the rest of the circuit will close, activating. It will happen sometime tomorrow during breakfast, and I, like many others, will be in the Great Hall at that moment. Considering that in such a variation, this magic does not cause direct harm, and is not malicious, because my social attitude lies in the phrase, for the greater good, then hypothetical protection systems, if they are set up for this, will not work, and from tomorrow evening the guys will have unforgettable dreams, the plots of which their brain will create itself based on my messages. After the ritual, I created a vial out of the air through permanent transfiguration, and strictly according to the instructions, I extracted the memories of the Slytherin meeting. I will present them as anonymous memories if you believe the books, then when you look at the memories of a wizard who was under the spell of concealment and invisibility, this wizard cannot be seen. Chapter 371 After putting the bottle with the others and checking for the presence of disguise charms on myself, I again went to the exit from Hogwarts. Under the light of the stars in a clear night sky, breathing fresh air, I reached the border of anti-apparition charms and moved to the threshold of Mr. Goober's house. As soon as I knocked on the door, it immediately opened, though not without the help of Willie, the important house elf. Dear unwelcome guest has decided to disturb the Honorable Mr. Goober again. Again, Willie. Didn't Mr. Goober say I'd be back? He did, of course, he did. How could he not the house elf stepped aside to let me into the house, but I didn't have to walk far. Mr. Goober was already walking toward the exit, dressed in a black business suit and robe. Don't just stand there, young man, the old man complained, gesturing me out of the way like a fly. No respect, well, and Merlin with him, old people should be respected. We're going straight to Hogwarts. But. I thought that you would go there only in the morning. Wasn't it you? young man, who said that there is no time to waste so we don't waste it. Come with me the old man abruptly turned around and again walked down the corridor deeper into the house. I hurried after him. Then why did you drive me away right from the doorstep? Just an old man's whim. We approached the fireplace, in which a yellow-red flame from the firewood was quietly burning. Mr. Goober took a handful of flow of powder and threw it into the fire, whispering a couple of phrases. When the flame changed color but still remained yellow, Mr. Goober stuck his head into the fire, talking about something with an invisible and inaudible interlocutor on the other side. After a dozen seconds, the old man emerged from the fireplace, again throwing a handful of flow of powder, and this time the flame turned green. As if setting an example, Mr. Goober took some flow of powder again and went inside. Hogwarts headmaster's office, he said clearly throwing the flow of powder at his feet and disappearing in a green flash of flame. I had to follow his example, and after a few seconds, I smoothly walked out of the fireplace in Dumbledore's office. Contrary to my expectations, there was no semi-darkness or the usual weak lighting, a bulky chandelier was burning in all the lights upstairs, flooding the office with soft yellow light more than enough. The headmaster was sitting at his desk in his usual purple robe, and Mr. Goober was just saying something to him. As a lawyer for the House of Black, and a representative of the interests of both the House of Black in general and Mr. Knight in particular, I officially request permission to visit potential witnesses and victims in the upcoming case. I allow it, Eric. Of course, I allow it. Just for Merlin's sake, not too long the headmaster nodded. There is one sickly pink person moving around our beloved castle, capable of creating problems for all of us out of the blue. Don't worry, Albus. Everything will be fine, 
the old man nodded and turned to me. Don't just stand there, young man, please. Take me to the hospital wing. Without any further ado, we left the headmaster's office, and Dumbledore stayed inside, pondering over something and making notes with a quill on a long parchment. Once again, we had to walk through the dark corridors of the castle, and when I offered to hide us with charms, Mr. Goober merely brushed us off. Do I look like a youngster who decided to sneak into the women's locker room of the house team, do I not? Not at all. Exactly. Remember, young man. Whoever hides is always to blame. No matter what. But you can hide. I'm well aware that despite everything, you are a student at Hogwarts, and the local rules apply to you just as much as they do to the rest of students. Nodding, I hid myself with charms. Contrary to my expectations, we didn't encounter a single living person, just a couple of ghosts. After quietly reaching the hospital wing, Mr. Goober stepped inside and headed for Madame Pomfrey's office. In a couple of minutes, he returned from there with a folder, a copy of the one I'd certified. He then made his way through the rows of bunks to the second room, where the girls' beds were behind a screen. Lady Greengrass was still there, and surprise flashed in her eyes when she saw the old man. After a quick conversation among themselves, they went behind the screen, and, as I understood, there, the girls gave oral testimony, which Mr. Goober carefully recorded. After that, the lawyer came out to aboard me. Mr. Knight. Please show me the container with the memories, if you don't mind. Of course, I nodded, pulling four vials out of my pocket, and Mr. Goober swiped a wand that suddenly appeared in his hands over them. Four of the exact same vials appeared in the air in front of the lawyer, and a black leather briefcase appeared on the floor in front of him. It opened on its own, and Mr. Goober put the slightly thickened folder and the vials in it. That's all we'll need. Send a list of applications to your contact. With this, the door to the hospital wing opened, and Professor McGonagall appeared on the doorstep in her full everyday parade, a black floor-length gown, a green robe, and a pointed hat. She was looking at us over neat rectangular glasses. Mr. Knight, Mr. Goober, the professor nodded to the lawyer respectfully but not deeply, a great rarity. The headmaster asks you to come to his office urgently. Professor, we nodded simultaneously and quickly followed McGonagall. Chapter 372 The headmaster's office has hardly changed over the past time, but there are definitely more wizards now. In the chair in front of the headmaster sat a stately lady of indeterminate age. Her facial features were predatory and a little sharp, a mixture of typical English and Finnish appearance, which did not spoil her in the slightest. Under the tightly wrapped black robe, only low-heeled boots could be seen. A little further away, as if put in a corner as punishment, stood Moody and Nymphadora. Dumbledore looked at them reproachfully, but this only worked on Tonks, causing a completely opposite effect in Moody he only looked back defiantly, leaning on his staff. Ah, Mr. Knight, Mr. Goober, the headmaster turned his attention to us without a smile, inviting us to pass. That will be all, Minerva, I won't distract you from patrolling. As soon as Professor McGonagall left the office, Amelia Bones it was definitely her, I saw her photo looked at me very sternly and displeased. I'm very curious to know, she spoke in a voice literally freezing through, for what reason are these two valiant law enforcement officers, with papers, almost storming my house? A matter of urgent importance, Madam Bones, I nodded. What could possibly be the occasion for such a thing? I, too, the headmaster leaned back in his chair, folding his arms together, would love to hear it. For the umpteenth time in the last twenty-four hours, I have retold the essence of the situation that happened, but now I have also added the reasons for my haste whoever succeeds first has the advantage. Mr. Goober, by the way, at the very beginning of the conversation, took a sitting position on one of the chairs, listening with ecstasy and, apparently, trying to find out the missing details. The essence of the current situation is clear to me. Out of respect for Alastair, as a professional in his field, and since I allowed myself to be dragged out of the house at such a late time, then so be it, I will sign and accept your application. Hearing this, Nymphadora smiled, and with a victorious gesture, gave out a silent, yes. Moody grinned. Why don't you sit down the headmaster turned to Moody. I'd rather stand, the retired aura croaked. Overview is better this way. However, 
Madame Bones continued her thought while Mr. Goober rose from his chair and began laying out on the table before the head of the DMLE the materials he had gathered. I must disappoint you. Cases like this are handled by the Wisengamot in a small group, and it consists mostly of members of old families with rather radical views and supporters of Minister Fudge. You must realize that this case will not be heard in your favor, and there's nothing I can do about it. The task of the DMLE in such matters is to collect data and bring charges, along with the provision of case materials. That's where you're wrong, with all due respect, Mr. Goober spoke up as he took his seat. My client has the status of a member of the Wisengamot. In the case, in the role of the victim, and in the case of a counterclaim the accused, his official ward acts, all responsibility for whose actions is assumed by my client. Um. Excuse me, Mr. Goober, but who are we talking about? Madame Bones clearly did not understand the essence of the unfolding dialogue. And I think, smiled the headmaster, I get it. You, Mr. Knight, should be congratulated but I, with your permission, I can only sympathize. Maybe someone will explain to me too Madame Bones looked around with a displeased glance. Allow me, I began to pull out the parchment I had received from the Heritage Hall and with it the mentoring contract. I am the official representative of the House of Black Interests at Wisengamot. Here is the relevant document, created and certified according to all the rules in the Heritage Hall. And here is the mentoring contract with Hermione Jean Granger. I put the documents on the table in front of Madame Bones, and in doing so, I aroused her keenest interest, as well as that of Moody and Nymphadora. After examining the documents thoroughly, Madame Bones looked at me again. May I make copies and attach them to the case file? Of course. A couple of wand swings and copies of the documents lay on the table next to the originals. In this case, said the head of the DMLE, things are changing dramatically. If a member of the Wisengamot is directly involved in the case, then it is considered in full. I'm sorry, I decided to clarify some points. But in one way or another, the case involves children of families whose representatives are members of the Wisengamot. Isn't that a reason for a full meeting? Not at all. This is possible only in the case of a collective petition, and the members of the Wisengamot, whose families include the defendants in the case, are removed from voting and making the final decision. And considering the names of the defendants, a full meeting is unprofitable for them because, in a small meeting, the ratio of their supporters is higher, no matter what anyone says. Headmaster, came the gargoyle's mechanical but emotional voice. A strange pink woman is trying to get in to see you. Should I let her in? Dumbledore sighed sadly but only nodded in agreement. Apparently, that was enough. Chapter 373 Headmaster I turned to Dumbledore before Umbridge showed up, and I'm 100% sure it's her. I hope you will support my little impromptu. Depends on the impromptu, he smiled sparingly. I want to know, Umbridge said from the doorway, walking in importantly and quickly. She was still wearing some sort of pink business style combination. Why is Hogwarts turning into a passageway, and the signal charms won't stop beeping every now and then in the Dada office? Dolores, Amelia nodded. Oh, what an unexpected surprise, Umbridge smiled sweetly, looking around the audience and paying special attention to Moody and Nymphadora. Amelia! What brings you at such a late hour to such an atypical place for the head of the DMLE and in such extravagant company? Also, Mr. Knight, why aren't you in bed at that same late hour conspiracy's intrigue? Investigations, I couldn't resist answering. Please explain, Umbridge immediately shifted her gaze to me. A case will be opened on a recent incident, I explained briefly. Will you sit down? Pulling up a chair for Professor Umbridge, I smiled politely, and this pink woman thanked me with a smile and sat down. She evokes strong associations with one teacher in my past life. They are very similar both in appearance and in the manner of speaking. The thing is, Professor, I continued to explain my point. That in the person of these children from, of course, respected and influential families, we are faced not only with the organization of a serious crime, in case of success of which we could expect some sad consequences for individual families in the near future but also with a much bigger problem. Umbridge squinted her eyes, looking at me intently with a smile. Which one, may I ask? A public, active, demonstrative disregard for the ministry in general, and Minister Fudge in particular. I'm afraid I don't quite understand you. 
Do you know what kind of rumors the Slytherins involved in the incident are spreading know what were their motives I'll tell you. They're spreading rumors that you know who is back. Umbridge's face hardened, making the smile less lively, stony. More than that. The organizer of the action was Draco Malfoy himself, saying that, allegedly, you know who personally instructed him to deal with the green grass girls. But that's not all. The others listened, agreed, shared, saying, yes, yes, the Dark Lord is great. That's enough, Mr. Knight, Umbridge held out her hand in front of me. I don't wish to hear such blatant lies about Voldemort's alleged revival. And I understand you perfectly, believe me. But that's not the point. If we leave everything as it is. The position of the Ministry and the Minister regarding what happened is obvious, Umbridge cut off. Miss Granger exceeded the acceptable measure of self-defense. However, the paragraph on self-defense does not specify permissible measures with the numerical superiority of the attackers, whose number exceeds the defending side by more than three times. Umbridge looked at me again with slightly squinted eyes and a slight sly smile. But, on the other hand, there is a medical examination, certified by the seal of the healing master. It says there are traces of Imperio on Daphne Greengrass. Unfortunately, the wands of the attackers have probably already been erased, and Priory Incantatum will show only a set of simple household spells. There are only memories. Which don't count as evidence, Umbridge finished for me. Exactly, I nodded, smiling slyly in response. As a result, we have a stalemate in which a lot of things seem to have happened, but there is no one really to blame. But isn't the Ministry, like the Minister himself, supposed to maintain not only the law but also order by stopping harmful, malicious ferment in society that can destabilize and destroy all that our society has been hard at work building for the last 14 years. Very curious, Umbridge smiled even wider. As I understand it, you have some sort of suggestion some opinion, absolutely. Chapter 374 Trying not to inadvertently look at the rest of those present, which can be regarded as a search for support. I put a serious expression on my face. This seemingly rather ordinary incident, apart from the location, is the key one. A turning point. If the ministry now goes along with the influence of the old families, covering their desire to protect their children, it will discredit all authority. These oldest families will finally be convinced of their impunity if they cover their tracks a little better. They will continue to carry out their propaganda about the revival of the Dark Lord, thereby mocking the minister and his cabinet. It is in this case, at this moment, gathering the will in a fist, the ministry and minister fudge will show that the government is strong and united as never before. Umbridge stared at me silently for several seconds. The small group of the Wisengamot will not vote in your favor. Small you see, Professor, Miss Granger is my ward under a mentoring contract, and I myself am a member of the Wisengamot representing the interests of the House of Black, and I take full responsibility for Miss Granger's actions in this incident. How incredible the twists and turns of life can sometimes be. Umbridge smiled again, not even doubting my words. It is understandable such a lie is easy to check, and the punishment can be severe. In order to have some more specific opinion on the situation, I would like to look at the memories. I can help you with that, Dumbledore got up from his chair. Please, Professor, I happen to have the pensieve lying around. Then Madame Bones expressed a desire to get acquainted with the memoirs, and Mr. Goober made another copy and immediately notarized the document of their authenticity. The authenticity of the copies, but the quality check and the authenticity of the memories themselves will be confirmed by the Ministry's legilimens if I order such a service. It is rarely ordered because they don't have any legal force, which means that they are useless. When everyone in the person of three people plunged into the pensieve, Moody, banging his staff and prosthesis on the floor, came up to me. You owe me a bottle of good fire whiskey, lad, he grinned. I learned too much about myself and my preferences today from the mouth of that bitch bones. This needs to be filled with excellent swill. No problem. Where should I send it to you? Take it to headquarters. And make sure there are no additives in it. I know you. Moody trudged to his corner, and I couldn't resist and, without any wands and verbal formulas, without even moving my hand, sent a stinging jinx into him. An inaudible and almost invisible fast beam of the spell that was about to sting the retired aura in one place suddenly came across the tip of the staff that seemed to flash by accidentally. 
such a genius, and yet such a rookie, grinned Alastor, not turning around and continuing to move. Constant vigilance. It took fifteen minutes for the ladies and Dumbledore himself, who was interested in the events, to review the memories provided, after which they all returned to their empty seats. There was no place for smiles anymore. I can say with confidence, Umbridge looked us over that the minister will be interested in what happened. But the final decision is his. It's okay, I smiled. Even if a decision is made not in my favor, I will use the right of a representative of the house in the Wisengamot to resolve issues of encroachments on the honor of my ward. What kind, may I ask Umbridge smiled again. As far as I remember, a duel of honor is allowed only between equals in status or achievements, or a wizard of the corresponding status must be placed. I simply showed my hand with the Aroboros ring. Master of Transfiguration, at your service. As far as I know, there are no Grand Masters in the Wisengamot and among the houses of those involved in the case, so. Actually, I wasn't planning on revealing this nuance just yet. Still, perhaps it could affect the final decision of Umbridge and the Minister, which means that the members of the Wisengamot who support him will already be on our side. So will the neutrals and, so to speak, the Dumbledore's supporters, most of them, as well as some of the pure bloods, because today are green grass and tomorrow are their children. Everyone understands that, so should Amelia Bones, whose niece is in the same year with us but at Hufflepuff. Amazing! exclaimed Umbridge in amazement, and the others almost dropped their jaws. Only Dumbledore and Moody were grinning at something. Since when does Hogwarts produce masters? Apparently, the headmaster grinned into his beard, right from now. On this note, our impromptu and unpredictable meeting came to an end, and I went to bed with a clear conscience. I still need to come up with a way to protect the green grass girls, or at least have an emergency, fast and effective communication with them. Chapter 375 Night, the moon came out from behind the horizon, flooding everything with its rays. Rare clouds covered the starry sky, and I, left in black trousers, shirt and vest, sat on the windowsill, looking into the endless distance of space, and only mad. It was just the wildest snoring of the Weasley, shamelessly spoiling the atmosphere. Still, I didn't use any spells occlumency allowed me to ward off unwanted stimuli, passing them on deaf ears. I couldn't sleep, and the reason was simple I was tormented by the question, why didn't Skeeter leave the castle? According to the remaining mark on her, which should only dissipate in about a day, the same applies to the Slytherins. I followed the movements of the dam reporter around the castle, mentally superimposing her location on the memorized three-dimensional map. Is she immortal someone has applied Obliviate on her in this castle, and she continues to walk relaxed? You're asking me. I'm talking to myself in my head. So you're asking me after I'll go and find out what she's running around the castle for. Come to think of it, you're right. Jumping off the windowsill, I grabbed my coat from the makeshift hanger by my bed, put it on. On some reflexes, I threw a bag over my shoulder and, conjuring various concealing charms on myself, quickly left the room, followed by the common room, going towards the mark. Once I ran into Professor McGonagall patrolling the corridors, but I went unnoticed. Another time I ran into Filch, who was muttering something to his beloved cat, and again I went unnoticed. Skeeter's mark led me to a closet on the dungeon level small but roomy enough to accommodate not only various utensils, but also several people. Leaning against the wall next to the closet door, I mentally turned to Rowena. Can you check what's going on in there? Rowena didn't answer, but she moved by a shadow in that direction, and I felt an almost imperceptible outflow of magic. Wanting to start practicing myself in obtaining information through the architect's ability, I tried, so to speak, to feel what was happening in the closet. It didn't work out right away and not completely, but there is some effect. Under Rowena's quiet laugh in my head, I began to understand exactly what was going on there not to see, not to hear, but to understand. Skeeter was sitting on an upturned bucket and, in the light of a simple lumos, was reading her own notes in a notebook with great interest. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't understand the contents of the inscriptions. Insufficient sensitivity level when working with shadows, Rowena informed me. Can you understand yes? It looks like she was taking notes of everything that happened and carefully writing down all the information she got. Does it say anything about who caught her and cleaned up her memory no? 
the notes end with her escaping from the room where you had the fight. Hmm, interesting. Dropping the bag from my shoulder, I opened it, calling for a couple of newspapers and parchment. Using memory and a weak diff indo, I cut a message from a newspaper text and placed it on parchment with the charms of eternal gluing, walking through the parchment with the energy of hemomancy in this way, excess magic is removed and becomes neutral, and these charms, like many others, work even after cleaning. After folding the message several times, I asked Rowena to put it in Skeeter's clothes pocket, and returning the bag to its standard location, behind my back, I went away there's nothing more for me to do here. If I understand the character of this lady correctly, then most likely, she will act in a very definite way. And if she doesn't? Also good. After wandering around the castle for a while and not finding anything interesting or worthy of attention, by dawn, I returned to the door of the hospital wing and sat on the windowsill opposite. Of course, I was fully under the spell of concealment, and Filch, with his cat, who had passed by, didn't pay any attention to me at all. As I expected, exactly at the time I was accustomed to, Hermione quietly slipped out of the hospital wing in her school uniform and robe. Miona, I called out to the girl, pulling off my disguise and jumping off the windowsill. She stopped and looked at me for a brief moment with a not particularly understanding look, after which she recognized, acknowledged, and smiled. Max. I guess the sedatives are still working. I walked over and hugged her, getting a symmetrical response. How are you I asked, pulling away. It seemed to me that it was better for you to spend this time in a purely female company. I knew you'd think so. I'm okay. Are you sure? Yes, she nodded confidently. The threat was inconsequential. I was much more affected by the end goal of the threat and the methods of its implementation. A little more, and you'll be looking at things just like me, I shook my head. I guess that's to be expected, Hermione shrugged. But just because I'm fine doesn't mean that everything will stay as it is. Absolutely. You don't have to worry about that. After hugging the girl for a moment, we went to where, in fact, she was going by force of habit to practice. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this journey, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please drop a comment down below.